Take the Bible, please, and turn to Matthew chapter 24. We're speaking this morning on this subject, a faith that can shake the world. A faith that can shake the world. In Matthew chapter 24, we start in verse 6. The Lord Jesus Christ, speaking of the signs of the times and of the end of the age, said, And ye shall hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that ye be not troubled. And all of those of you who are worrying about the Vietnam conflict, you're breaking the Lord's command right here. Be not troubled, he said, for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet, for nations shall rise against nation, and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be famines and pestilences and earthquakes in divers places. Earthquakes are in the headlines of today's paper, but they're also in the headlines of God's Word. And the Bible teaches that the greatest earthquakes are out in front of us. There are earthquakes coming that will affect the entire earth and that will literally flatten mountains, so the Word of God tells us. But you see, the scientists are also saying something of the same thing. Dr. Charles F. Richter of California Institute of Technology the man for whom the Richter scale is named, says this, and I quote, no place is safe from earthquakes, unquote, and that's Florida too. And then he goes on to say, I quote, we can predict confidently that where earthquakes have occurred in the past, they will occur again, perhaps soon, and as population increases, they will be more destructive. And then another man, very eminent man, a geologist named Lloyd S. Clough, recently warned in a conference to 300 scientists and seismologists at Stanford University that all evidence indicates continuous activity in earthquake zones with imminent possibility of major shocks. And so what we used to think was good old terra firma, solid earth, is but a quivering, pulsating, uh, motion ready to erupt at any time and a panel on earthquake prediction made up of great scientists from all over the earth reported to pres to the president of the united states in 1968 and i quote we may expect a great earthquake with a magnitude exceeding eight about once a year about once a year well all of these scientists are telling us that something is happening to Mother Earth. And every one of these tremors simply warns us of greater tremors and greater quakes that are to come. But of course, we would have known that had we not heard what Dr. Richter had to say. And had we not heard what Mr. Clough had to say and these others, because we have the Bible and the Lord Jesus tells us in the end times that earthquakes are going to increase and that these things will indeed be signs of the end time. But I have found something very strange this week as I've been studying on this particular subject. I have found that it seems that every time God does something great, every time God does something sensational, every time God does something that is uh, very real in the spiritual world, he seems to punctuate it, he seems to underscore it, he seems to say amen with an earthquake. There is a sense in which earthquakes in the physical world seem to speak of God's power in the spiritual world. Now, as you follow along with me this morning, you're going to understand what I'm talking about as we look in the Bible. When God does something of great import in the spiritual world, he seems to confirm it, he seems to emphasize it, he seems to underscore it with an earthquake in the physical world. Now, if you don't believe that, you follow along and see as we study the Bible. In the first place, I want you to notice at Calvary, there was an earthquake. When the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified, there was an earthquake. Look in Matthew chapter 27 for just a moment, verse 51. The Bible says here concerning the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ when he was on the cross, and behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. That is, the rocks were broken asunder. It seemed that old Mother Earth seemed to shudder when the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. 
It seems that the very heart of the rocks were broken. Sometimes when we hear, we hear of a man who refuses the Lord Jesus Christ, we say, that man has a heart as hard as a rock. Dear friend, he's got a heart harder than a rock if he can refuse the Lord Jesus Christ because when Jesus was crucified, the very heart of the rocks were broken. I wonder, has the crucifixion of Jesus Christ that caused the earth to quake disturbed your heart yet? When Jesus was crucified, the rocks broke the earth quivered. There was an earthquake at the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ. But I want you to notice another earthquake. Would you look in Matthew again in Matthew 28 verses 1 and 2. The Bible says, In the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake. For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it and so forth. And then the story of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Not only was there an earthquake at our redemption, there was an earthquake at his resurrection also. When the Lord Jesus came out of the grave, there was an earthquake. And God was showing in the physical realm that something tremendous was happening in the spiritual realm. And God confirmed it with an earthquake. The earth shook and shuddered because God was doing something great. God was doing something fantastic. And I tell you, the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is something great. We don't honor a dead Christ on a cross. We look forward to seeing a living Christ on a throne. We've not come here to mourn a corpse. We've come to hail a conqueror, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I tell you, the devil doesn't like the idea of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he has leveled the mightiest artillery of hell against the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we have these liberal theologians today who talk about Jesus being raised in spirit and all that, and while his body lies rotting in a Syrian tomb, the great spirit of Jesus goes marching on. Don't you believe it, dear friend? Jesus Christ came out of that grave, literally, bodily, physically, up out of the grave, the Lord Jesus Christ came. One man imagines the demons speaking, one demon to another, and says, oh, if those liberal theologians ever really let Jesus Christ out of that grave, hell help us, all heaven might break loose. And I tell you, dear friend, that's right. Boy, hell will need some help when heaven breaks loose. I tell you, if we believe that Jesus is alive, we'll know something of what Paul spoke about when he said that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. What is God showing us when God caused the earth to quiver? God is showing this power here. I tell you, there's power in the blood of Jesus, and there was an earthquake to confirm it. There's power in his resurrection, and there was an earthquake to confirm it. And then I want you to notice another earthquake that took place. Look in the book of Acts in the fourth chapter in the 31st verse. The book of Acts chapter 4 and verse 31. The disciples were being persecuted. They had been commanded not to preach anymore in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. So they met together for a prayer meeting. Let's go back to verse 29. And this is the way they prayed. And they said, Now, Lord, behold their threatenings, and grant unto thy servants that with all boldness they may speak thy word by stretching forth thine hand to heal, and that signs and wonders may be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. When God sent the Holy Spirit to this early church in mighty power, God caused an earthquake to confirm it. God caused the place to shake. How many times have you ever been in a prayer meeting where somebody prays something like this, Oh, Lord, shake this place. Man, if he did, it scares to death. Shake this place. I mean, this wasn't, this wasn't figurative. This was literal. The place started to quiver. It started to tremble. There was an earthquake. God shook the place. And he did it in order to confirm that these people had supernatural power. I, you see, an earthquake in the physical realm speaks of power. Greater power is released in an earthquake of, say, uh, eight on the Richter scale than is released in the greatest atomic explosion yet known to man. You see, there's power here. There's power in the blood. There's power in the resurrection. There's power in the Holy Ghost. Ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, you see? And God was showing them in the physical realm something of what was happening in the spiritual realm. God was showing them that I'm going to give you something that not only can shake the earth, but shake the very foundations of hell, the power of the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we have people who say, well, I just serve God my poor little old weak way. Well, stop it. 
and serve God in his wonderful, mighty, glorious, powerful way, ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. I'm not talking about the power of personality or the power of intellect. I'm not talking about the power of money. I'm talking about a power that this world knows nothing about, the power of the Holy Spirit. God says it's something real, so real that he, he caused the earth to quake in order to confirm it to mankind. Oh, we need this wonderful power. We don't need to be Quakers. We need to be earthquakers. We need to be people who have been filled with the Spirit of Almighty God. Now, many of us are shaky about what we believe rather than being shaken by it. These people were shaken by it, but they weren't shaky about it. Brother, they had a supernatural dimension to their belief in the, in the Bible. All right, now, I want you to notice another earthquake. There's not only the earthquake of redemption, the earthquake of resurrection, the earthquake of revival, but I want you to notice another earthquake, the earthquake of God's rescue. Would you notice in uh, Acts, the 16th chapter, here's another story of an earthquake, beginning in verse 25. You remember the story. Old Paul and Silas had been in the city of Philippi. They'd been preaching the gospel. They'd had a wonderful time preaching. God sent a revival, but of course the devil got all stirred up about it. And these two preachers ended up in prison. But notice verse 25. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them. And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and every man's bands were loosed. Elvis Presley used to sing a song called Jailhouse Rock. Well, here it is right here, brother. The, 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 the jailhouse used to, it, it, it just started to rock and to roll and, and the bonds fell from their hands and from their feet and they were set free right here. Now, what was this? What was God doing? I tell you, dear friend, God was showing us, God was confirming with an earthquake that he's able to deliver his own children. God is showing the mighty power that he has to usward. One of my favorite verses is Isaiah 54, verse 17. And brother, I tell you, preachers need it. Here it is. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord, and their righteousness is of me, saith the Lord. Isn't that a great verse if you're a servant of the Lord? No weapon that's formed against you shall prosper. And the same God that shook that jail to pieces is the same God that sits in glory now, and he's the God who is able to deliver thee. He is able to deliver thee. And so God confirmed it with an earthquake. Now, he doesn't cause an earthquake every time one of his children get in trouble. If he did, he'd shake the world to pieces. But he did it here with Paul and Silas. He did it here in the New Testament to let us know once and for all to confirm his power, his power to deliver. Oh, there's power in the blood. There's power in the resurrection. There's power in the Holy Spirit. There's the power of God to deliver us. And God seems to confirm it and say amen with an earthquake. Now, I want you to notice that these earthquakes that are in the past but I want to slow down a little bit now and talk about some earthquakes that are in the future because I say the greatest earthquakes are yet to come. The Bible describes these earthquakes and if we'll call one the earthquake of redemption, the other of resurrection, the other of revival, and the other of rescue, we'll call these earthquakes of retribution. For God is going to send his judgment upon this earth and God is going to send his judgment in the form of earthquakes. The Lord Jesus said there'll be famines and pestilences and earthquakes. But then he said, these are the beginnings of sorrows. These are the beginnings of sorrows. In other words, these things are just simply uh, uh, prophesying greater troubles, greater tribulation that's going to come on the earth. And this little quake that they had out in California was only God's messenger, only God telling us in a particular way that even greater, more terrible, terrifying things are going to happen on the earth. Take your Bible and open to the book of Revelation, if you will. And I want you to notice several scriptures in the book of Revelation that speak of earthquakes that will be here on earth during the tribulation period. Look, in the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, I don't have time to elaborate on any of these, but I just want to read them for you. You can go back and uh, read them when you get home. Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. All right, then I want you to notice, if you will, chapter 8 and verse 5. And the angel took the censer and filled it with the fire of the altar and cast it into the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightning and an earthquake. Then I want you to notice in chapter 11, verse 13. 
the same hour there was a great earthquake and the tenth part of the city fell and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven and then I want you to notice in chapter 16 verse 18 and there were voices and thunders and lightnings and there was a great earthquake such as was not since men were upon the earth so mighty an earthquake and so great it seems as though all nature is going to be in convulsions during this period known as the great tribulation and it will be interesting to many of you to know that it is in an earthquake that russia red communist russia will meet her doom did you know that the bible teaches that russia in the last days is going to invade palestine and she will be destroyed in the land of Palestine by an earthquake. And it's one of these earthquakes that we mentioned here in the book of the Revelation. Look in Ezekiel chapter 38, and I want you to notice just several facts that I think will be a source of instruction and I hope a source of comfort to you. In Ezekiel chapter 38, now the Bible makes it plain that in the last days there's going to be an invasion of Israel. Notice in chapter 38, verse 16, And thou shalt come up against my people Israel as a cloud to cover the land. It shall be in the latter days. And notice again in chapter 38, verse 8, And after many days thou shalt be visited, in the latter years thou shalt come into the land that is brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people against the mountains of Israel. In the last days, there's going to be an invasion of Israel. After Israel has been regathered, after they're back in their land, it's going to take place, the Bible says, in the last days. And then I want you to notice something else about this invasion that is going to occur when Israel is dwelling safely. Notice verses 10 and 11. Thus saith the Lord God, it shall also come to pass that at the same time things shall come into thy mind and thou shalt think an evil thought. This is something will come into the invader's mind, the one who's going to invade Israel. And thou shalt say, I will go up to the land of unwalled villages. I will go to them that are at rest, that dwell safely, all of them dwelling without walls and having neither bars nor gates. And then I want you to notice again in verse 14. Therefore, son of man, prophesy and say unto Gog, G-O-G, Thus saith the Lord God, G-O-D, In the day when my people of Israel dwelleth safely, shalt thou not know it? This invasion is going to take place when Israel is dwelling safely. Therefore, it will not take place immediately. It could not take place today. It could not take place tomorrow. For Israel is not dwelling safely right now. They're bristling with armaments. They're surrounded by the Arab nation. They are in fear and trembling, and I don't care how much braggadocio they have about them. They know they are in serious trouble at this particular moment. But the Bible teaches that there is coming an alliance of Western powers headed up by ten nations in Europe, of which the European Economic Federation, United Europe, is a foregleam. And out of that federation is coming a leader that the world calls Antichrist, and the Bi or the Bible calls Antichrist. And the Bible makes it plain that this leader is going to make a covenant with Israel. And he's going to say to Israel, all right, you don't have to worry anymore. He's going to make a seven-year covenant with them. They will relax and say, oh, at last. And they won't have to worry about their tanks and their guns and their planes and their ships and their atomic bombs and all of these things. They'll say, our Messiah has come. This is what we prayed for. They will believe that this Antichrist is the Messiah. Jesus said, I've come in my Father's name, you'll not receive me. If another comes in his own name, him you'll receive. They will believe this man, and they will relax. It is at that time that Russia, that great northern bear, will look down upon the land of Palestine. She knows of the vast untold wealth there in the Dead Sea. She knows of the oil that lays in the bosom of Abraham's land. She's always wanted a warm water port. And many, many, many years ago, it's been known that the one who controls the Middle East will control the world and Russia will see this relaxed attitude and Russia will sweep down from the north. There's, it's going to occur, however, when Israel is dwelling safely. The next thing I want you to notice is this. Therefore, by the way, I believe it's going to occur during the tribulation period because that's when this is going to take place. Antichrist is going to make a covenant with Israel and it will occur during the first part of the tribulation period. I want you to notice also it's going to be an invasion from the north. Look in Ezekiel 38, verse 15. 
God's word says, And thou shalt come from thy place out of the north parts, thou and many people with thee. Now remember, north in the Bible is always north of Palestine. Palestine is the hub. Palestine is the center. All prophecy is related to Palestine. If you were to draw a line from Jerusalem to the North Pole, it'd go right through Moscow. It would go right through Moscow. This was the land to the north. All Bible scholars for centuries have been saying Gog and Magog that are mentioned here in chapter 2 of this verse refer to Russia. As early as 1897, Professor C.A. Totten of Yale University said this, We voice with the prophets in damning the policy of Russia and warn the English-speaking race that wheresoever they are colonized and under whatsoever flag they are marshaled, that Gog, the land of Magog, the prince of Rush, Meshach and Tubal, is their sworn and determined enemy to the sword's hilt. This is what this man said in 1897. The Schofield Bible says in the footnotes that the reference is to Russia and so forth. It's very plain that the land that's north of Palestine is Russia and God is saying several things. There's going to be an invasion. There's going to be an invasion in the latter years. This invasion is going to be from the north and the Bible makes it plain that when this army that comes from the north, when Israel is dwelling safely, when it comes against Israel, that it will be destroyed. But it will be destroyed by an earthquake. When Russia smites Israel, God will smite Russia. God said in his word, He that touches Israel is like he that touches the apple of my eye. That's what God said. God says, Them that bless thee, I'll bless. And those that curse thee, I'll curse. And I want you to notice what is going to happen. Look in verse 18 of Ezekiel chapter 38. And it shall come to pass at the same time when Gog shall come against the land of Israel, saith the Lord God, that my fury shall come up in my face. For in my jealousy and in the fire of my wrath have I spoken. Surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel, so that the fishes of the sea and the fowls of the heaven and the beasts of the field and all creeping things that creep upon the earth and all the men that are upon the face of the earth shall shake at my presence and the mountains shall be thrown down, and the steep places shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. It will cause such consternation among the armies of Russia that they will turn upon one another to kill them. Notice in verse 21, And I will call for a sword against him throughout all my mountains, saith the Lord God, and every man's sword shall be against his brother. And I will plead against him with pestilence and with blood, and I will rain upon him and upon his bands and upon the many people that are with him and overflowing rain and great hailstones, fire and brimstone. I tell you, dear friend, only one-sixth of this army will be saved. So many people will be slain in this great earthquake and in this battle that God Almighty fights for the land of Israel that it will take them seven months to bury the dead. That's what the Bible says in the next chapter. It says when people go through that land, they'll have to hold their nose for the stench of decaying flesh and dead bloated bodies. I can imagine they will bury them with bulldozers in great trenches. It will take them seven months and finally patrols will go up and down the land and when they spot a a skeleton or a bone, they'll put up a banner and say, here, come bury this, that the land might be cleansed of this great scourge. It's going to take place and God is going to do it with an earthquake. And do you know what the result is going to be? Many people are going to believe in God because of this. Notice in verse 23. And God says, Thus will I magnify myself and sanctify myself, and I will be known in the eyes of many nations, and they shall know that I am the Lord. The God that Russia says doesn't exist will bury her in the land of Palestine. How ironic. The God that she says does not exist will give her a grave in the land of Palestine, tiny little Israel. That's what's going to happen. And God is going to do it with an earthquake that will be so great that it will flatten mountains. Tidal waves and repercussions will be felt around the world. The Bible says those that dwell carelessly in the aisles, not the aisles of the church, I hope I'm not talking about you, but the aisles like the aisles in the ocean, they're going to find it. They're going to feel it. Oh, there's a great shaking coming, dear friend. Earthquakes of retribution. But I want to mention the last one. I want to save just a moment for that. There's still yet another earthquake coming. And we'll call that the earthquake of his reign, R-E-I-G-N, when Jesus comes to rule again. Do you know the Bible teaches that at the close of this tribulation period that the Lord Jesus Christ is going to come from heaven and he's going to come with all of the saints. You see, we won't be here on earth when Russia invades Palestine. We'll be watching from heaven. But then after this is over, 
and Jesus Christ is coming back to this earth to reign, then we're going to come with him. And when we come with him, his feet are going to touch the Mount of Olives. And when the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ come to the Mount of Olives, there's going to be an earthquake, and the Bible says that the Mount of Olives is going to split in two. There's going to be an earthquake. Really, preacher? Look in Zechariah chapter 14 for just a moment. Oh, I tell you, dear friend, it's going to be something. I mean, when the Lord comes back to this earth again. You see, every time God does something great, he punctuates it with an earthquake, it seems. Notice, I mean something tremendous, something monumental, something earth-shaking. Notice in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 4, the Bible speaks of his return to this earth. And it says, His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof toward the east and toward the west, and there shall be a very great valley, and half the mountain shall remove toward the north, and half of it toward the south. And ye shall flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley of the mountains shall reach unto Azel. Yea, ye shall flee like as ye fled before the earthquake in the days of Uzziah king of Judah. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee. Jesus is going to come, and the saints will come with him, robed in white linen, pure and clean. Antichrist will be defeated at the Battle of Armageddon. But oh, won't it be something when those nail-pierced feet touch that Mount of Olives? Oh, that's an earthquake yet to come. The Bible tells us about it. It's the earthquake of his reign. It seems like when God does something, he says, Amen, with an earthquake. He did it at the crucifixion. He did it at the resurrection. He did it when the Holy Spirit came. He did it when he set those people free in that Philippian jail. Oh, my dear friend, he's going to do it during the tribulation when he judges this world and destroys Russia. And he's going to do it when he comes again. God is going to shake this world. One last verse I want you to see. And my, what a tremendous verse it is. Look in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. Verse 26, yet once more I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. Once more, God says, you want to find out what I'm going to shake? <laughs> One more time, God says, I'm going to shake not only the earth, but I'm going to shake heaven too. And what is the purpose? God says, yet once more signifieth the removing of those things that are shaken that those things that cannot be shaken may remain. You know what that means? Listen to me. Listen, teenager. Listen. God said, I'm going to shake heaven and earth, and everything that's not nailed down is going to come loose. That's what he's saying. I'm going to shake everything that can be shaken so that the things that cannot be shaken will remain. Now, how many things do you know of that can't be shaken? Your bank account can be shaken, fellow. <laughs> and your health can be shaken. And your government can be shaken. And your philosophies can be shaken. But I know a few things that cannot be shaken. And the greatest of them is Jesus, Rock of Ages. And brother, when that shaking starts, you better find a firm place to stand. You may quiver on the rock, but it'll never quiver under you. Oh, listen, that's the place to stand. You better get tied down. You better get lashed to something. For God, God in these last days is telling us that these earthquakes and these things that are happening, famines, pestilences, wars, these are signs that God is about to close shop. And he's going to shake everything. They were having an earthquake, I'm told, and a little grandmother was still in a rocking chair, rocking while the quake was going on. They said, Granny, aren't you afraid? She said, No, bless God. I'm glad to know I've got a, world, a God who can still shape this old world. I tell you, we serve a great God. Ours is the faith that shakes the world. Let's pray. Now, dear friend, are you standing on shaky ground right now? Hmm? I mean, is there foundation under your life? What are you clinging to? Where is your hope? God's going to shake everything that can be shaken. And I'm talking to some pretty shaky people right now. Oh, dear friend, 
Give your hearts to Jesus. My, how God loves you. He brought you here to hear this message that you might be saved. Father in heaven, bless as we give the invitation. And I pray, dear Lord, that many who are not saved will come to know Jesus. In his name, amen. Now look up here for just a moment. In a moment, we're going to have what we call our invitation hymn. We're going to sing, and I'll stand right down here at the front. And if today you will say an everlasting yes to Jesus Christ, if today you will turn from your sin as you know you ought, and give your heart to Jesus Christ by faith, the Lord will save you. Now, I don't mean that if you come down this aisle and shake my hand that you're going to get a halo and sprout wings and never do anything bad again. I don't mean that. But I do mean this, that if you will honestly, sincerely repent of your sin and trust Jesus Christ who died on the cross to pay for your sin, God will forgive your sin, Christ will come into your life, he'll give you a new life and a new power. Oh, yes, you'll have to grow. There'll be many things you'll have to learn. You're not going to be perfect just like that. But there will be a change that'll take place in you, the same change that took place in me and thousands, millions of others. The Lord will save you, and he'll help you to grow in the grace and knowledge of Jesus, and one day when he comes again, before the tribulation, you'll be taken up to meet him in the air. If you should die before that time, your body will be raised out of the grave, body and spirit, together meet the Lord Jesus in the air. I tell you, if I were not a Christian, I'd fall on my knees and give my heart to Jesus right here in this pulpit. I would. I wouldn't wait. I wouldn't put it off. I wouldn't go without Jesus Christ for 24 hours for $1 million. I mean that. If you were to say, Brother Rogers, all you have to do is just set aside your Christianity for 24 hours and then pick up a $1 million, I'd say, no deal. I might die in that 24 hours. Christ might come in that 24 hours. I might lose my mind in that 24 hours. I don't know. But yet some of you have been going day after day after day after day for nothing. You've been refusing Jesus. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Today, if you hear his voice, harden not your heart. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Today is the day, wonderful day, that you can find Christ. And as we stand and sing, I want the teenagers, the boys and girls, the men and women, the mothers, the fathers, who will give their hearts to Jesus Christ and trust him, I want you to come forward. I have some trained counselors who will guide you in this decision. It will only take a few moments and will give you some literature to help you. When we start to sing, I want you to leave your seat and come. Now, I'm speaking to others of you who are already saved, and you ought to transfer your church membership. You ought to come and say, Brother Rogers, I'd like to be a member of this church. I'm already saved, but I'd like to be a member. So if you need to be saved, you come. If you've been saved and need to make it public, you come. If you need to transfer your membership, you come while we sing what hymn? 236.